Welcome to Lit Survey 11. I'm going to be reading Address to Congress on Women's Suffrage by Carrie Chapman Catt for our Keystone Prep Test Prep. Women's suffrage is inevitable. Suffragists knew it before November 4th, 1917, opponents afterward. Three distinct causes made it inevitable. First, the history of our country. Ours is a nation born of revolution, of rebellion against a system of government so securely entrenched in the customs and traditions of human society that in 1776, it seemed impregnable. From the beginning of things, nations had been ruled by kings and for kings, by kings and for kings, while the people served and paid the cost. The American revolutionists boldly proclaimed the heresies taxation without representation is tyranny. Governments derive their just powers from the consent of the governed. The colonists won and the nation was established as a result of their victory has held unfailingly that these two fundamental principles of democratic government are not only the spiritual source of our national existence, but have been our chief historic pride and at all times the sheet anger of our liberties. With such a, such a history behind it, how can our nation escape the logic it has never failed to follow when its last enfranchised class calls for the votes? Behold our Uncle Sam floating the banner with one hand. Taxation without representation is tyranny. And with the other seizing the billions of dollars paid in taxes by women whom he refuses representation. Behold him again, welcoming the boys of 21 and the newly made immigrant citizen to a voice in their own government, while he denies that fundamental right of democracy to thousands of women public school teachers from whom many of these men learn all they know of citizenship and patriotism to women college presidents to women who preach in our pupils, interpret laws in court, preside over our hospitals, write books and magazines, and serve in every uplifting moral and social enterprise. Is there a single man who can justify such inequality of treatment, such outrageous discrimination? Not one. Second, the suffrage for women already established in the United States makes women's suffrage for the nation inevitable. When Elihu Root as president of the American Society of International Law at the 11th annual meeting in Washington, April 26, 1917 said, the world cannot be half democratic and half autocratic. It must be all democratic or all Prussian. There can be no compromise. He voiced a general truth. Precisely the same intuition has already taught the blindest and most hostile foe of women's suffrage that our nation cannot long continue a condition under which government in half its territory rests upon the consent of half of the people and in the other half upon the consent of all the people, a condition which, which grants representation to the tax in half of its territory and denies it in the other half, a condition which permits women in some states to share in the election of the president, senators, and representatives, and denies them that privilege in others. It is too obvious to require demonstration that women's suffrage, now covering half our territory, will eventually be ordained in all the nation. No one will deny it. The only question left is when and how will it be completely established? Your party platforms have pledged women's suffrage. Then why not be honest? Frank friends of our cause adopt it in reality as your own, make it a party program and fight with us. As a party measure, a measure of all parties, why not put the amendment through Congress and the legislatures? We shall all be better friends. We shall have a happier nation. We women will be free to support loyally the party of our choice, and we shall be far prouder of our history. To you and the supporters of our cause in the Senate and House, and the number is large, the suffragists of the nation express their grateful thanks. This address is not meant for you. We are more truly appreciative of all you've done than any words can express. We ask you to make a last hard fight for the amendment during the present session. Since last we asked a vote on this amendment, your position has been fortified by the addition to suffrage territory of Great Britain, Canada, and New York. 
Gentlemen, we hereby petition you, our only designated representatives, to redress our grievances by the immediate passage of the federal suffrage amendment and to use your influence to secure its ratification in your own state in order that the women of our nation may be endowed with political freedom before the next presidential election and that our nation may resume its world leadership in democracy. Women's suffrage is coming, you know it. Will you honorable senators and members of the House of Representatives help or hinder it? 